going to talk about birds. Hi, so as Dr. Marshall said, my name is Ella Masha, and I am a part of a project which uh, has been in the works since um, 2011, so it's been going on for eight years, and we're looking at the survivorship of birds um, on preserves versus human um, impacted areas in the Lake Erie Island region. And here I have just some cute birds that we found. They're all babies. Uh, first one's a baby cardinal, next one's a baby kingbird, and then that's a baby blackbird.
Um, so the two birds that we looked at the starship rates for are the American robin and the red-winged blackbird. That is a uh, red female red-winged blackbird. The male, obviously, you probably know, are black with uh, orange on red on their wings. These are some other bird species that we uh, also captured to get a general view of all of the different species that exist on Lake Erie Island. The first one is a Carolina wren. Second one is a yellow warbler, and that is a Baltimore Oriole. Um, and that one's a black capped chickadee, goldfinch, and a uh, barn swallow. So these are the numbers that we banded. And the total birds we banded this year were 289 of those. Robins accounted for 23 of them, and the red winged blackbirds accounted for 135. We got 15 recaps, and of those 15 recaps, three of them were robins, and six of them were red winged blackbirds. Looking at the entirety of the project, uh, we have recapped 220 birds, and we have banded 200, almost 250 robins since 2011, and we have banded a little over 1,000, uh, and we reached the 1,000 mark this year, which is pretty cool. So just to give you a view of what types of species we are seeing, um, the total number of species uh, for this year was 23, uh, and then since 2011, we have seen 41. Um, the most common this, this year we've seen are red-winged blackbirds, American robins, the ones we've studied, and then yellow warbler, common grackle, tree swell, and Baltimore oil round out the list for the most common. And then this is just to give an overview of the amount of species we find on each uh, island, on each location, I meant. Um, so the lowest uh, species count we got was for South Bass, Bayview Office. And then the rest are pretty comparable with Gibraltar, Middle Best, and South Best being the same. So this is the data that we received through after we do the mark. So what we're looking at is um, different models of survivorship. Um, and we look at the Delta AIC. And AIC is just um, a way to estimate the quality of a model given the data, um, so given the bird banding data that we inserted into the program. Um, so anything under two is all equally uh, has all has the same quality. So the first model is the one that we use to model the amount of survivorship per island, and this isn't looking at habitats, but looking at um, by island. So the uh, C is stands for survivorship, and then the P stands for um, the recapture rate. So that so the first model is saying the survivorship is considering um, only uh, the islands and not like the time at all, but just from islands, from basis on the islands, how are the birds surviving? And then the encounter rate is constant, not considering time or islands at all. The results we got were um, that the results we got showed that the uh, most, the survivorship rates were the highest for um, Bayview Office and Gibraltar. Um, but we did not get any data. We did not get enough recap data for North Bass or for South Bass Shaft Preserve um, to gain any information. This is for comparing human-dominated um, areas versus preserves. Um, when you look at this, you see multiple models um, have a high level of quality for the estimate, for getting estimates of survivorship, or is an estimate of the quality. So we needed, because all of these models could use the data and model survivorship very well, we had to use a compilation of these models. And um, when you make a compilation, you use at, you look at the AIC weight, um, which is which ones are most reflected. So in the data that I'm going to show, um, you will see that the first model is reflected, um, the first model reflects 37% you know, and so on, so on. So we use all of the models, not just the top ones, we use all of them, but some are weighted more and show up more in the conclusion. And so here you find that actually preserves do not increase the survivorship rate. The birds were, uh, specifically with American robins, the birds were more likely to survive on um, human dominated areas. Um, and this is year to year, and then as you can see, the averages show that as well. In relationship to red wings, um, we did the same process that we did with Robin. Um, we used the first model that was given. Um, so we looked at survivorship and the islands. And then for recaps, we considered the time, so from year to year. 
And then from that, we got the uh, the highest starship rates were again Gibraltar, and uh, we actually got enough recap rates, uh, recap data. So we have numbers for North Bass and, and uh, South Bass Chest Preserve. Um, we did not get enough for uh, the Bayview office, so that was why. Not sure enough. And then for the habitats, or not habitats, sorry, human dominated and preserved. Um, again, we found the same thing with, uh, as with American Robins, and which we needed to compile the models. Um, and with that, we got, um, this is a little less clear than with the uh, American Robins, um, but the same with, if you look at the averages, they do do better. Um, the, bees, the birds do survive more on uh, human dominated uh, areas versus preserved. So, when you're considering um, why are these birds surviving better in human dominant areas, the not dominated areas, you have to consider the, the species of birds that we're looking at. We're looking at American robins and red winged blackbirds, and they're no well known generalists, as well as they're some of the most abundant birds uh, in the entire country. So it could be a testament. The reason why they do survive better in human dominated areas may not be the testament. May not be a testament to the quality of uh, habitat, uh, the quality of habitat in human dominated areas versus the quality of habitat on preserves, but just how well are these birds able to thrive in specific in every in every area? Which begs the question: Maybe we are using the wrong measurement to show if the preserves are good for breeding. Um, for breeding habitat purposes. Um, and this brings up some less well, uh, less well known birds or less popular or populous birds. Um, the indigo bunting we found on Middle Bass Island Preserve. Um, as you can see, those are the, uh, those are the estimates for the uh, population trends in Ohio, and they've been steadily declining since um, around 19, 1980s. And then this one's probably the most special bird that we caught this year. Um, this is a yellow-breasted chat. And um, not within the span of the project that we've been doing, but within the span of, uh, but within the, span of the entirety of banding on the islands, which is 2003. So for 15 years, we've only caught four of them. And this was, this was the fourth one. And as you can see, their numbers are also declining in Ohio as well. So finding. So in the future, this project could possibly look at do are the amount of species or the types of species a better indicative of um, the habitat quality versus just survivorship rates of very you know very common birds. And I would like to thank Dr. Marshall. Um, I would like to thank uh, all of my classmates for helping and. I would like to thank all the boat captains for helping us get to where we needed to be, uh, Lisa Brawl and also um, Tom Bartlett, who's the master bander. And we got a lot of people. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So in these in these words you have definitely talked about 
Uh, we didn't consider that. Um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, I know that we don't have any numbers on the predators that we look. I personally uh, only saw osprey like once or twice, very minimally, and I don't, I don't see, I didn't see any um, on the preserves. I saw them mainly um, north bass. So I was like, yeah, once or twice. Um, and so that could definitely be a consideration, but because we don't necessarily have data and we can't catch, because birds of prey are generally larger and those you can't catch with the nest. So I think to get like statistics out of her from number, it'd be harder to look into. But that was the case. Um, it's mainly abundant. It definitely because um, for at least for this uh, project, we put them in. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of shrubland, there's grasses, and there's trees. So we put them in um, areas that covered all, all of those. So it shouldn't have mattered um, per se the habitat. But it's definitely we find you catch more blackbirds and micro robins just because they are so many. Of, there are so many of them. Twenty-four species and stuff. I think you said you saw, but when you showed the islands, it was like the number of species per island was like twelve or ten or eight, like that fluctuated. Are there some islands that you're only seeing one species on, and some that you're not? And mm -hmm. What do you know about those islands that might be driving towards one species? Do you not have enough data to be able? To I don't think we have enough data to really look into that. But like I showed the indigo bunting and the uh, yellow-breasted chat, and those were only one of those. So the numbers, like there are some where yes, you only see one versus like you see a lot. Like as I said, the most I listed the most common birds, and those are generally seen through three. I would say like three or four more. I mean, like common grackle we saw everywhere, micron robin everywhere, robin blackbird everywhere. Um, but then we did see those two only on the preserve. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. He's from OSU. Um, his advisor is Lisa Roll, who's on the, the park intern here, but she's on vacation this week, so I'm here to introduce Matt. He, um, he's working on a really cool project that was uh, that started last. It started last. Uh, Lisa started it last year, but it's kind of a continuation of a, a project that Doug Kane started 10 years ago or so. Uh, so, so here's Matt. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here and listening to this. Um, I, uh, I worked with Lisa Brohl on a project on middle bass uh, where we were studying forest composition and succession, um, mostly based on um, deep removal of invasive species and uh, the uh, mammal ash borer and how it basically decimated the entire forest removed. All the green ash, almost all the blue ash, even though it was, uh, it was more resistant. And uh, I was, I'll uh, push through it a little bit, but basically, um, sorry. <laughs> all right, I'm just going to go into the natural history and recent human um, history of middle bass because I think it's worth giving some kind of background on the subject um, before hopping into it. Um, the, the glacial retreat carved out the lake basin, as you know, because you've all seen the grooves on the islands. Um, it's composed of mostly dolomite bedrock, which is partially why, like, the pH and soil and water is pretty consistent because of the pH buffer. Um, upon arrival of <laughs> Europeans, they uh, released hogs um, on middle bass and it pretty much decimated the entire rattlesnake population. Just to give you an idea of where uh, you know human intervention started. Um, they uh, exported uh, timber to the mainland um, and the original forest was pretty much gone completely by 1860. So there was virtually no old growth and it was starting from scratch. And there was lots of disruption going on along the way. So, um, for example, vineyards dominating the landscape, but during prohibition, they had to shut them down. Um, they were pretty much abandoned, and that's that's where we see uh, that's what we're left with, basically. Um, 
and that, that landscape left behind was very suitable for the green ash um, due to soil composition and um, just lack of composition, basically. Um, the mild climate due to stabilization allows like very wide variety um, of very diverse species um, across the island. So definitely worth protecting and looking into. All right, the evil emerald ash borer. Um, native to Eastern Asia, um, first detected in the U.S. and Canada around 2002. Um, it infests trees of two centimeters, two centimeters in diameter or greater. Um, you've probably seen the larval trails, like if you've been taking hikes. Uh, you, a lot of these down trees, like they, they no longer have bark, and these trails that they create um, are basically them moving through the phloem in the larval stage um, and consuming before um, they burrow in further and pupate and come back out to those T-shaped holes. Um, important part here is like the, uh, that path that they create, it girdles the tree um, because it cuts off the nutrient uptake and uh, water transportation throughout the tree. So it does, it takes a while, like there's, there's a lagging effect that you'll see um, with uh, the data that was taken um, three or four years ago, 2007. You'll see like the, the green ash is still dominant. Um, It, it was dominant, but it was in the heat of, a, um, of the invasion of the emerald ash borer. So you don't really get to see it until 2017, 2018 when we started taking our data. Um, the general effects in the forest infest all species of ash. Blue ash, like I said before, they can be mildly resistant. They're trying to develop a hybrid species now, but uh, they're worried it could diffuse um, or, uh, the wood's genetic makeup wipe out the species altogether, and they don't really want that. Um, the falling of these trees after girdling um, and the, the limbs dropping opens up the canopy completely um, because they were they were dominant. There was really nothing else there at the time. There was some silver maple, but very little. Um, and this leads to higher understory productivity because there's more, uh, more photosynthetic activity going on, more um, sunlight coming through. They, they grow rapidly, colonize, and reproduce. They, um, they definitely take advantage of what they have, and they're very, very efficient at using nutrients in the soil and taking it before other plants can get to it. Um, Amor honeysuckle and the buckthorn are the two local, local species, but I'm mostly looking at Amor honeysuckle. Um, prior research, I'll be brief with this. Um, in 1984, Borner initiated the first investigation, um, and he, he really created a lot of the methods quadrats and um, the Borner importance value. Um, in 2007, uh, Dr. Kane and Eckert continued the research at the height of the EAV invasion, um, which is what I was talking about before, because it shows at that time you had very, very high uh, importance values for the green ash, but they were at the time being completely destroyed. It, it just takes a few years. Um, 2017, uh, Daru, prior to me, and Lisa uh, studied the aftermath of the invasion. Um, then in fall, in the fall of 2017, 2018, and 2018, um, EnviroScience, which is a um, environmental um, consulting agency, came through, and they basically sprayed as much as they could. But uh, I will get to that later. Why I don't think that is very effective, but um, you'll see from the data, it's, it had an impact, but not very much. Uh, my current objective is to determine uh, current forest plot composition and figure out whether or not um, removal actually affects forest composition. Um, primary, again, amber honeysuckle. There's, there's other species to consider, but this one's the most important, so I focused on it. Um, we obtained soil samples, and I tried to draw connections um, to succession, um, forest succession and composition. Um, did, did the honeysuckle alter soil composition? And if it did alter, alter soil composition, is it going to have uh, an impact This is our study site. Uh, the top one is Cypernik and Bottom is Schneider. They're both about um, eight acres. Uh, very, very heavily wooded, so it was, it was definitely interesting getting in there and trying to take uh, DBH measurements, lots of mosquitoes, lots of, lots of poison ivy. Um, and I included the one on the right just to give you 
to a certain extent and show you the, uh, the old land use um, and how, how divided and fragmented it was just to show you um, how this kind of began. Um, and the setup. I didn't really have a lot to do with the setup because they took care of it pretty well last year. Um, they, they set up five different, uh, five different plots in each, um, in each track, uh, 10 meter by 10 meter, um, alternating, as you can see. And um, within the northeast corner of each, they had a 5 by 5 nested quadrat, which we used for different measurements. And then within that, an even smaller one of 0.5 to 2 meters um, for the smallest measurement. This is a, kind of a summary of the tree measurements. Fairly self-explanatory, the important part is the end there. We, we calculated relative density, relative frequency, relative coverage, um, and the importance values. That's, that's the big one. Uh, we split the plot. Soil collection was kind of not off the cuff. I had to do a little bit of research, but we weren't really sure how to go about it because it was, it was unprecedented here. So uh, we split it in four squares, assigned each one, one through four, going clockwise. Um, and we used a number randomizer with the hope that we could maintain some statistical internal validity. Um, but uh, we removed a core of soil six to eight inches beneath the surface, connected five samples from each, um, and then we combined them and sent those, uh, sent those two separate bags from each site off to uh, Brookside Laboratories. Okay, so this is uh, the Borner importance value. Uh, this, this is the culmination of a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of data but I, I personally don't like, this is, this is what was used in the last one, but I don't like it because it's, it's an oversimplification. Like the, you see the difference in roughly dogwood for Schneider and diaper mix are supposedly the same across, across those two years, but that's definitely not the case when you look at the, the relative density and their raw importance, out, importance values. But something you can, uh, you can take advantage of is the green ash because clearly um, they're coming back slowly. I think it's partially partially due to the removal of invasive species. Um, same thing with mulberry. We're slowly cutting down on them, got rid of the buckthorn altogether. So we're moving in the right direction. It's just going to take some time and I think some uh, different management tactics. Uh, these are the raw importance values. Um, the ones that you really want to look at are silver maple um, in the Schneider plot. And the diff you see it uh, decreased by 0.38, which is pretty significant. Um, that column and green ash increased by 0.31. Um, and we, I think this is the case because most, the silver maple, a lot of them died um, for some reason or another. And I think this was due to uh, the removal of certain nutrients in the soil, um, in the soil horizons, or um, certain, certain uh, cycling mechanisms that I'll tell you about later. Um, and on the diapering side, uh, on the diapering side, uh, you can just see that um, the uh, roughly dogwood was clearly dominant, and uh, green ash increased a little bit, but the mulberry definitely took a hit. So we're going to move on. Okay, this is a this is a very very summarized version of uh, the soil soil data that I received. Um, but the ones that you, you want to look at are organic matter, how in diapering gets significantly higher than in Schneider, um, and the estimated nitrogen release is also much higher in phosphorus, much higher. Uh, calcium and magnesium, that, that kind of just makes sense because uh, dolomite is um, calcium magnesium carbonate. So like when it decomposes into its components, you're, you're going to have that dissolved in the soil. So it makes sense. Um, this, is a, this is the tricky part here. Um, <laughs> so because we know that the, the uh, organic matter was much higher in diapering, and that's partially related to uh, the very high level of a uh, roughly dogwood. I mean, you can just uh, you can see the the totals are 229 total versus 101 total for for seed, for uh, trees individually, um, and that that's going to lead to more organic matter, um, more decomposition, and uh, yeah. and the uh, estimated nitrogen release. This uh, this and phosphorus are the two important parts I want to get to because of mineralization and immobilization. Um, so, let's go here. Yeah, I'm going to explain it through this slide. 
Um, basically, they, uh, the amber honeysuckle is phenotypically, um, it has, it is, it is a phenotypic, <laughs> it is known for its phenotypic plasticity, um, which basically means that uh, it's able to um, have more than one genotype, um, and a single genotype uh, can have produce multiple uh, phenotypes depending on environmental um, constraints. Um, makes it a habitat journalist and like especially dangerous um, as an invasive species. And uh, multiple studies that I looked through basically summarize the same thing. Um, soils with, with exotic species, they focus primarily on Amherst honeysuckle for this. Um, higher inorganic nitrogen, higher mineralization, higher soil organic carbon density, um, an increase in net primary productivity, et cetera. Um, and what, what I want you to take away from that is the mineralization. So, um, oops. Um, decomposition, uh, basically mineralization is the decomposition in which uh, nutrients and organic matter are oxidized and released um, in a soluble inorganic form that can be used by plants, um, which is typically, you would think it would be a good thing, but when that happens in excess, you no longer have, um, you're kind of like it's, like, it's almost like unsustainable fishing. Eventually, they, it can't, um, uh, it can't, it can't recycle and come back enough. So you potentially, it, it has happened in other sites where it took over and they removed it, and the soil just took years and years and years to come back um, because it just didn't, it just took too long. I mean, it required, it relied on rain and diffusion from um, the, the lower soil horizons, which takes a long time. Um, it's also shown that they are allelopathic. They release compounds uh, that can be um, that can inhibit growth of other species, um, and that can have lots of cascading effects across a variety of different systems within the ecosystem. So that is important to note as well. Um, getting towards the end, they uh, they have fairly hydric soil, so they're anaerobic. Um, the micropores and macropores are full of water, uh, so they require anaerobic respiration and denitrification in this, in this site, we think, um, dominates and it lowers soil productivity. Um, and that's just another reason why honeysuckle is in a bad situation. Um, I, bas I basically explained that already before, unsustainable, unsustainable, unsustainable. Um, yeah, and uh, My suggestions for management, honestly, I don't think they're, I, I don't think the way honeysuckle grows fits with basically spraying uh, because they, they shoot out laterally and, and they can spread for long distances right on the top of the surface. Like that's how they absorb so many nutrients that um, other species can't. It makes them so competitive. They can't, they can't get down to the taproot that a lot of, uh, a lot of trees require. Um, in conclusion, I do think, I mean, based on the data, it's pretty clear that the composition did change. It, it absolutely changed. But I don't think it was significant, especially with the Amber Honeysuckle, because the, uh, the importance values didn't change at all. They were both three and three for each, and I think that's because so many survived along the way, and we just need to find a better way to, to go about it and to do that. Um, they're, they're, uh, you can cut them spray them, uh, you can pull them out, but honestly the only way to do it is to go year after year after year. You have to keep up with it because they're so effective at feeding and uh, producing shoots out of their roots even though you can cut the entire thing off. So, Yeah, I think the soil composition absolutely changed as well, um, but I can't quite determine that because uh, we don't have that historical data to really compare in site comparison. So. Yeah, for my acknowledgments, uh, I want to thank Lisa. She was great. Um, she was extremely passionate and helpful. Ohio Sea Grant for the opportunity. Dr. Beatty um, for classroom insights that related to nutrient cycling. And Ohio State for providing tools along the way.
they're already um, in the, in the uh, Schneider plot. They're already pretty dominant at this point. Um, but again, if we don't do something about the honeysuckle, it could it could lead to the soil and deprive it of the nutrients required for even for large trees. I mean, it's shown even trees with massive PBH is going to be taken down by these surrounding communities of honeysuckle. Um, none that are native that I that I know of. I guess um, it's it's what grows there naturally. It feeds naturally. It seems to really like the hydric soils. Um, so I, at least for now, I think that was the end of the section. Yeah. Hey, do you want to ask Matt more questions or the break? <laughs> The next speaker um, worked with me this term, and her name is Krista Kiley. She's from my hometown, Cleveland. Um, now, but she's not there now. Well, obviously she's in this room, but <laughs> she is at uh, the University of New England. Um, so, if you're wondering why you saw someone with the University of New England, but they didn't say clam chowder, or they they wondered why they weren't looking for their khakis. Um, that, that's why. Um, she is an oceanography major, so um, she's getting a little limnology here. This is her third summer at Stone Lab, actually. So uh, take it away. So um, this summer, as like Doug said, we explored planktonic algal community composition in the Maumee River, and we have been studying environmental factors and how they relate to toxin-producing cyanobacteria. Um, so, as I'm sure you're all aware by now, Lake Erie has been prone to many cyanobacterial harmful algal blooms, and this is due to a combination of human activity and environmental factors as well. Um, anthropogenic nutrient-rich runoff tends to accelerate productivity in the water column, but the changing climate has also been helping cyanobacteria grow as well. They grow much better in shallower, warmer waters, so as the climate warms, they have been able to invade waters where they were not found before. Within Erie specifically, the genera Aphanazomenon, Anabina, and Microcystis indicate um, the eutrophication that we've been seeing here. And these cyanobacteria um, and others too are capable of producing hepatotoxins, which are liver toxins uh, and or neurotoxins. And an example of a neurotoxin is saxitoxin, which we'll get into a little bit later. And these toxic genotypes have a positive correlation with total phosphorus, which adds even more risk to nutrient loading. Community composition in Lake Erie has remained pretty stable from the 1970s up through the late 1980s, but the dominant species often change from year to year. From the 1990s to the present, though, the lake has experienced heightened blooms and dramatic spikes in cyanobacterial populations. The Maumee River has since been identified as a source of nutrients and of cyanobacterial feed colonies. Um, these upstream early season blooms that sometimes start in the river are expected to have a positive correlation to Lake Erie's total algal content. And uh, in recent years, this is of increasing importance because microcystis has been found as early as March in the Maumee River. Cyanobacterial toxins, um, neurotoxins in particular, pose a lot of health hazards, both for animals and for human health. Within the past 100 years, there have been many cases of livestock, wild, and domestic animal poisoning that were traced back to cyanobacterial neurotoxins. And humans, too, have had both lethal and non-lethal cases of poisoning. Uh, you may have heard of paralytic shellfish poisoning, and that is an example of when there's bioaccumulation of dinoflagellates, which um, can also synthesize saxitoxin. Uh, accumulate within marine shellfish, and they can reach a concentration that is so high that it can be fatal to humans. And though we haven't seen that kind of bioaccumulation in Lake Erie yet, um, it has been observed moving up through the trophic levels just from cyanobacteria to Daphne and Magna, so that serves as evidence that 
potentially bioaccumulation could occur here on a larger scale. Staphylococcin is far better understood in marine environments, so researching how it behaves in freshwater is of increasing importance. With the warming climate and recent higher river discharge, um, we know that that can lead to higher nutrient loads and more seed colonies coming from the Maumee River. During the five weeks of testing that we have done so far, we weren't sure whether or not we would see saxitoxin in particular, but we did expect to see some proportion of cyanobacteria because a little bit is normal in an ecosystem. We thought that the community composition would be pretty steady throughout the five weeks that we have data for so far, but we knew that there would be some degree of fluctuation due to changes in the weather. When we sampled, we returned to the same six sites every week. Uh, we started here at Antwerp, which was um, our most upstream site, and then we moved through to the Bend, Independence Dam, uh, Napoleon, Mary Jane Thurston, and then ended at Farnsworth, which was our most downstream site. At each site, we first took a Cephi depth measurement, and then following a field rinse of our buckets and collection bottles, we took samples to be analyzed for uh, nitrogen, total phosphorus, and chlorophyll A. And in that picture there with that hand device, you can see that we are field filtering a sample for soluble nutrients, which were later analyzed on a field analytical device at the laboratory, which is that other picture there. Our unfiltered samples were also analyzed on a fluoroprobe back at the lab. Um, a fluoroprobe works by using particular wavelengths of light to excite the pigments in um, alpha cells, and then when these pigments fluoresce, um, that wavelength can be measured to determine their concentration. This probe was linked to a PC, which generated new readings every few seconds, and we collected the data for green algae, blue-green, cyanobacteria, uh, diatoms, cryptophytes, and then the total concentration as well. We analyzed every sample to a minimum of five stable data points, and later converted the raw biomass concentration data into percent biomass. And then lastly, we used um, this model of a YSI to determine the average surface temperature and concentration of dissolved oxygen at every site. And when all that was done, we performed our statistical analysis on the stat. For this experiment, a two-way ANOVA F test would have been ideal, but we don't yet have enough data to do that. So for now, we're just doing several one-way ANOVA tests. We ran all of them with the alpha value of 0.05 and actually found no algal group that we tested to be significantly different by site. Uh, we did find all of them, with the exception of diatoms, though, to be significantly different by date. And of those ones that were significantly different, we used two-piece post hoc tests to determine which pairs were significantly different. Uh, we're going to go through a couple slides now of community composition, and for all of these, the color key will be the same. Um, green will correspond to green algae, blue-green to blue-green, the brown will be diatoms, and red is cryptophytes. And when you read one of these, you'll notice um, that it says if we are looking upstream to downstream, we're starting at Antwerp, which is our most upstream site, and then the last um, thing on that axis is Farnsworth, which is our most downstream site. So you'll notice that weeks one and two look pretty similar in terms of community composition, but what you will want to note is that the concentrations were actually very different. Um, if you look at the y-axis, you'll notice that the first week's concentrations almost broke 300 for the total concentration, but um, just barely exceeded 30 in our second week. In weeks three and four, we did start to see some changes. Um, I think the most notable thing from these two weeks was that by week four, we detected a rise in the cyanobacterial population. They were still low, but this was the first time we would really seen a significant increase. This is our most recent data from week five, and this is um, by far our most significant result. Um, you'll notice that at some point between Napoleon and Mary Jane, there is um, a much higher concentration of blue-green algae that started between those sites, and we noticed that trend up until Farnsworth, which was our last site. 
and this is significant because this is indicative of a riverine bloom that will probably be flushed out to the lake once we get a good rain. Here we have data for the weekly means and standard error per group. Um, the Y error bars represent the standard error, and the letters denote significance groups based on Suki's post hoc test. The trends were fairly similar for the total, the green, and the cryptophytes. Um, they tended to rise and fall in similar patterns. The diatoms, however, did not. They started high like the rest, but then remained pretty low. And this was most likely because we had so little rain and water movement that they were most likely settling. And because we were just taking surface water samples, um, their populations wouldn't be reflected in our samples. Here we have the trends for the blue-green algae, which also had their own pattern. They remained low for our first three weeks, and then after that, we started to see a rise, which you saw in the earlier figures, too. And this may continue to increase in our next few weeks of testing. Here we have the weekly means and standard error per nutrient. The dissolved reactive phosphorus remained pretty stable. Um, it did start to drop a little bit towards the end, though. The most interesting finding from this is that the dominant form of nitrogen switched from nitrate to ammonium, and that happened during the same time that we saw the peak in the cyanobacterial population. Um, as I mentioned before, heat and lack of precipitation probably did impact our last two weeks of data. And this figure here shows that this year, that we're only like halfway through the summer, we have already had 20 degrees over 90, or sorry, 20 days over 90 degrees. Uh, so this is probably going to be a record-setting year for heat, which encourages cyanobacterial growth. Uh, you might remember from the first two weeks of community composition data also that there were um, pretty severe peaks at Mary Jane Thurston, and uh, not only did we notice the um, concentrations being very high there, but we also noticed an uh, awful sewage smell when we were sampling there. And past research never indicated a problem there, so if there is a localized sewage issue happening there now, it has to be something new. Past research also indicates that cyanobacterial populations tend to spike in later months, like in September. So as we continue research, we may see a more dramatic increase than what we've seen so far. As I mentioned earlier, a warming climate may make more waters at risk for invasion by toxin-producing cyanobacteria. Lake Baikal is a lake that never had any saxitoxin in it before, but within the past few years, they found cyanobacteria of the genus Anagena there actively making the toxin. And this is dangerous both for that lake and for others that are now susceptible to invasion because they have high recreation and tourist zones, and when the toxins accumulate in the littoral zones, those are usually the zones that humans and animals are interacting with. So continuing to monitor these waters is very important to defend health. Uh, furthermore, the samples that we collected are being used in ELISA kits to estimate the concentrations of both microcystin and of saxitoxins. And once we have that data, we can try to make some sort of conclusions with that, too. Uh, this figure here shows sampling from September um, of last year, and you'll notice how huge the blue-green population is. So this, again, reinforces that continuing uh, this research is very, very important. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Doug Kane, for walking me through this process and for teaching how to do everything. Um, and I'm also grateful to the lab assistants, Kira, Kevin, and Hallie for their help. Um, and also Haley, too, helped me with sampling during the past week, so I'm grateful for that. Um, the Ohio Department of Higher Education, Ohio Sea Grants, OSU, and Friends of Stone Lab also made this project possible. Thank you.
did an RU, and then I went up to EG main campus and did this interesting more research up there. So it's, so it's great to have uh, someone kind of follow my path. I was dubbed RU back in 2005, in case you didn't know that. So, <laughs> all right, so, so we'll let Jay talk about self-ethnic kind of bacteria. So um, this summer I looked at the nutrient and light limitation of benthic algae and or bacteria in Lake Erie. So eutrophication is when excess, excess nutrients lead to increased algal growth, and uh, this can create algal blooms, which can increase turbidity and decrease the plant life. They can also decrease the dissolved oxygen, which leads to large amounts of fish dying all the same time. And cyanobacteria can also produce toxins, such as microcystins and saxotoxins. And uh, microcystins tend to be studied the most because they create the most problems in Lake Erie. But uh, saxotoxins is not studied enough because it's usually causing problems in marine environments, which Krista talked a lot about this. But um, also, benthic cyanobacteria are not looked at much, which are the ones that are on the bottom of the lake living on rocks and mud. So this experiment focuses on light and nutrient limitation of benthic algae. So some questions about benthic algae are what limits their growth, um, whether it be nutrients like phosphorus or nitrogen, or the different forms of phosphorus and nitrogen, or if it's light. And also, which cyanobacteria produce the toxins? So um, which ones are in Lake Erie, and which ones of those are actually producing toxins? So what cyanobacteria can produce toxins? Um, some are in the water column such as microcystis, silicospermum, and planktothrix. And these are easier to study because all you have to do is just take some water from the surface of the water and sample that. And others that I'm looking at are benthic, such as oscillatoria, lingvia, and formidium. And these are harder to look at because you have to go to the bottom of the lake to sample them, to study them. So that's why they're not researched as much as the ones in the water column. But this is what my experiment focuses. Um, so, how do you do that? Um, you, what we did was we did a nutrient diffusing substrata experiment where um, pretty much you put, you take a container and you fill it with nutrients and uh, they'll diffuse out through a porous filter and depending on what nutrients you put inside them, um, algae will grow more or less on different nutrients and different light treatments. So, what we're looking at is um, if we increase the amount of the limiting nutrients, that should cause the most growth. Um, for the initial setup, um, we got a bunch of different containers with, or not different, we got a bunch of containers that were different colors with um, lids, and we drilled holes, holes in those, and we washed them with phosphate-free soap so that it wouldn't interfere with the experiment at all. And then we filled the cups with an auger solution, which is just a jelly-like substance, we mixed that with nutrients, and uh, after we filled it with the auger and it solidified, we placed a porous glass filter, or frit, on top of it, and that was where the nutrients would diffuse out of and the algae would grow on that. And the different treatments that we used were a control, which was just water and the auger, and phosphate, nitrate, ammonium, and then a combination of phosphate and nitrate and phosphate and ammonium. Then we did two different light treatments. One was a high light, which we put at depth of uh, half a meter, and the other one was low light, which was at two meters. And there was 120 samples total, and 60 was for each light treatment, so half and half. And then of the 60, 10 were for each nutrient treatment. 
So on the first day, we hung the crates from the dock in the same location. We randomized all the cups so that there wouldn't be any pattern. And they were just right below each other, the crates. And twice a week, we measured the concentrations of different kinds of algae with the flora probe, which Chris also used. Um, but we used the, um, a wand for it, which just measures the algae on a surface. So we were looking at green algae, cyanobacteria, diatoms, and the total concentration of algae, so all of them put together. And we measured all 120 samples twice a week. And here's what they looked like at the end of week one and the end of week two. Um, so on the first one, you can see that there's some growth and there's a lot of mud, too, which doesn't interfere in the reading. Um, and then the second week, there was even more growth and there was also some fly, uh, some worm casings growing on it. So. And here is a graph of the total chlorophyll A concentration versus time. So over the 14 days that we did this experiment. And for both of the treatments, the highlight and the low light, there was an, a general increase in growth. And for the highlight treatment, there was more growth than the low light. And there's really no pattern with the different nu nutrient treatments as you can see here. And here is the same kind of graph with just looking at the cyanobacteria. So the highlights still always had more growth, but the um, you can see more of a trend here where the phosphate and ammonia had the most growth, and then the ammonia was after that for both the highlight and the low light treatment. So here is a graph of the total chlorophyll A concentration um, for each treatment. And this is just on the last day that we took the grape out of the water. And uh, these are averages of the 10 replicates that we had. And we can see here again that the highlight always had more growth than the low light. But there was no effect of the nutrients on the treatment. And this was because the diatoms and green algae were dominant here. And those are limited by light and not nutrients. So the cyanobacteria wasn't much of this population. It was like 25%. And for just looking at cyanobacteria on the last day, um, the cyanobacteria was most abundant for highlight and phosphate and ammonia. So again, the highlight always had more growth than the low light. But yeah, phosphate and, nit or phosphate and ammonia was the highest growth. And just yesterday, I identified them under a microscope, and we saw that Prococcus was the most common cyanobacteria, and Lingia was the most, like the second most common that we saw. But um, it agreed with our results that we saw because most of the things that I saw were diatoms and green algae, and not cyanobacteria. So, um, so like I said before, the highlight always had more growth than the low light, and uh, Excess phosphorus and the reduced forms of nitrogen, such as ammonia, are likely to cause uh, increased growth of benthic cyanobacteria, just like they do with microcystis in the water column. So it's important to reduce both nitrogen and phosphorus to reduce algal growth. And uh, next week, um, I'm going to repeat this same experiment, or in the next few weeks. And we're going to see if different, and it's also going to be done again in the late summer. And we're going to see if different light conditions and different nutrients in the lake will affect um, the growth of the algae and have any different results. And also, um, from this experiment, we saved some of the samples for saxitoxin and DNA analysis. And that hasn't been done yet, so that'll be yet to come, all those results. And I just wanted to thank the University of Toledo for letting us borrow the Flora Probe wand and the Ohio Department of Higher Education for funding and Justin for uh, coming up with this idea and helping me through all this and then Kevin, Kira, and Hallie for helping me in the lab. That's it. Any questions? to 
do this with natural conditions. Do you have any recommendations on how you set up a, an experiment where you kind of push it towards starting out and with blue green algae and if you really wanted to, you know, push it that way, how? Um, I'm not sure really how you would just because, well, it would just be hard to try to get a con like a contained area of a benthic cyanobacteria, because then you'd have to have like a surface for it. Well, you could still do that. Yeah, you could. I guess you could have a bottle with just a surface on it, just like some objects in it. I guess you could, but. Um, I know that it can, but I don't know if it does yet because we have to send the saxitoxin out for analysis, or we have to do it. So. Yeah. Um, no, the idea was that um, just because we had two different depth treatments, um, the bottom one and the top one would both act like a surface that would be like the bottom of the lake, just at a half a meter and two meters. Justin was saying, yeah, my plan is to go to law school. So hopefully I will become an environmental lawyer. Um, I'm really interested in fish, though, so I was very uh, interested to work with Dr. Gray and look at emerald shiners. So that's uh, my project. So um, to really understand my study, I thought it was important to go over what's really important to the lab in general, uh, Dr. Gray's lab. And that's uh, looking at the bigger picture here. So the first is, um, how do fish respond to multiple environmental stressors? And the second would be, how will human-induced environmental change influence aquatic biodiversity? So these are two big thematic questions that are answered by all the projects done in Dr. Gray's lab, and my project is one of them. So for some general background, um, humans are destructive. Um, urban development, such as the impervious surfaces in the first image, um, and agriculture um, can be very devastating for aquatic ecosystems. Um, given these two types of environments, um, plus any major rain event, we get this. Um, these two Landsat images, um, the top would be a sediment influx, um, some sedimentary turbidity. So really quickly to define turbidity for you, that would be the cloudiness of the water, suspended particles, um, such as in that image. In the bottom, we have what everyone knows to be the algal blooms um, from the phosphorus and nitrogen runoff from the agricultural fields, and that causes turbidity. Um, so we see that turbidity can affect fish in multiple ways. The first way um, would be that it can disrupt visual abilities of fish. As Chelsea Neiman presented on a few weeks ago, um, walleye vision can be affected by algal and sedimentary turbidity, um, such as in this image right here, where in the clear water, the walleye can see the emerald shiner, um, its prey, or in the algal bloom, um, its vision may be impeded, they can no longer find its prey, um, and has uh, a lower fitness. Another effect of turbidity on um, fish is that it can cause their gill damage to fishes, um, meaning that the particles of the turbidity can get within the gills and cause gill abrasion, which can impede the fish from uptaking oxygen uh, as effectively as it would in a clear water environment. So swimming performance is a way to understand um, the effects of turbidity on fish, um, a, way to effect, a way to understand the metabolic process of a fish. Um, so swimming performance is measured by the critical swimming, 
swimming speed, which I will um, refer to from now on as U crit. Um, so the critical swimming speed is essentially the maximum velocity a fish can sustain for a set period. So in other words, this is how fast a fish can swim up until the point where it gets so tired that it switches from aerobic to anaerobic respiration. So a previous study, uh, Gray all 2014, um, looked at the effects of sedimentary turbidity on shiners. Um, it looked at five different shiner species in Canada, um, not the emerald shiners, so that's where my study comes into play. And it also did not look at um, how algal turbidity affects the swimming performance of shiners. So that's another um, novel feature of my study. Um, something to note here is that the pug nose shiner had significantly lowered um, swimming performance in sedimentary turbidity than in clear water. Um, the pug nose shiner now is extirpated from Lake Erie, um, which it could, this here could be a, a possible reason why. Um, so that's just something to look at. Um, and just to, to clarify, um, a higher swimming performance or a higher eucrit means that the fish is a better swimmer and can better perform in um, these environments. So going back to my research question, how do algal and sedimentary turbidity affect the swimming performance of emerald shire in Lake Erie? So I have three objectives. The first is to investigate the effects of turbidity on the physiology and swim performance of emerald shire. The second is to investigate how different types, algal, sedimentary, and a combination of the two, um, types of turbidity affect the swimming performance of emerald china. And the third is to compare the results that I get with the previous studies, such as in Gray et al. 2014, um, so we can expand our knowledge on the effects of turbidity on fishes. So my hypothesis is that both sedimentary and algal and a combination of the two will have an effect on the performance of shiners. And my prediction specifically um, clear water would have the highest swimming performance, sedimentary a little lower, mixed even lower, and then algal significantly lower, um, and I will get into why. So for methods, this is the fun part. Um, in terms of fish maintenance, we have here two holding tanks, two 20-gallon long tanks, which we store our emerald shiners in, and we have two acclimation tanks. The acclimation tanks are used for overnight acclimation of the emerald shiners to prepare them for the treatment that they'll be placed in the following day. Um, the holding tanks, you can see, have these little bags of ice because um, the lab we are in is not, it's not air conditioning, which makes it very difficult to keep these shiners alive. So we have to constantly replace um, these ice bags to ensure that our shiners don't all die overnight. So that is that. And going into our four treatments, I have a control treatment, um, clear water. And I'm planning, by the way, to do 15 um, replicates for each treatment. And um, I have a sedimentary treatment, which is comprised of muck from Lake Erie mixed with water to, to make this treatment. An algal treatment, which is a mixture of spinach, blended spinach, and spirulina to simulate the green and particle mix of an algal bloom. And then finally, a combination of the two, sedimentary and algal, um, three-fourths algal, one-fourth sedimentary. Um, and this is because in the lake, we don't see only algal turbidity or only sedimentary turbidity. There's a mixture of the two. So this is more of a real-world simulation. Um, the standardized level of turbidity for each treatment is 20 NTU. And this is uh, purposely done to mimic the conditions in the lake, as we often find these similar 20 NTU level um, turbidity in Lake Erie. So physiological trials, um, that's the goal of the study. And um, this is a swimming tunnel, swimming performance apparatus um, that I'm always describing to you guys. But here's an actual picture of it. Um, so here it's outfitted with a plexiglass tube. This is where the shiner goes. Um, the shiner is faced with the incoming current that it must swim against. Um, and it, the current keeps on increasing in speed incrementally um, up until the point in which the shiner becomes so tired that it falls back to the end of the pipe. Um, and that's when the trial is over. Um, also, we have these straws. You may be wondering why there are a bunch of straws in my tube. That's to ensure that the flow within the tube is even. It creates a microturbulent flow that is equivalent throughout all pockets of the tube. This is so that the fish can't go to part of the tube where there might be less flow, and that would skew the results. Also, have the um, Tupperware container to make sure that the flow is even, and this pretty uh, strong pump that's 3,600 gallons an hour to ensure that the water is fast enough to effectively um, work these fish to death. 
<laughs> so here is a video. This is at the slowest speed. The shiner's in the back. And at a faster speed, getting a little tired here. And then this is at a very fast speed. Um, and you can see it, it's, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the fish treadmill. So um, I've been here for six weeks now, and four of those weeks were pretty much made up of putting together the apparatus because it always seemed like there were four days wait, spent waiting for shipments to come in to build it, and then I'd find out that it doesn't work the way I wanted to, so we had to order something else, and then just a lot of troubleshooting, um, but we finally got working to the way that we needed to be working. Um, and at this point, I have 15 trials done out of 60. Like I said, I'm planning on doing 15 per treatment, but for the purposes of this presentation, I wanted to have um, enough data on clear and algal turbidity to really make a, a convincing argument. Um, so here, the results are that um, we ran a ANCOVA using um, the log transformed standard length as a covariate. And you can see here that the clear um, swimming performance is significantly higher than the algal swimming performance, which suggests that fish that are exposed to algal blooms have a lower swimming performance than do fish that are not. Um, additionally, we ran a regression um, looking at how does the standard length of the fish affect its critical swimming speed. And we found that fish that are longer typically have higher swimming performances. Um, this trend is a positive trend seen in both um, treatments, as the blue being the clear and the, the green being the algal treatment. Um, there was one outlier here um, in the clear that is making the trend seem lower than it should be, um, but there is a reason for that. That's because I used the ball valve, and the ball valve is hard to adjust at first. This is all the, the setup of the trial. It, it didn't work the way I wanted to, and I turned it too high, I think. I killed the fish a little too early. Um, so that's what happened there, I think. Anyway, um, to look at a few confounding variables that may have affected the results, um, temperature and dissolved oxygen are very important to look at here because temperature can affect the metabolism, the metabolic rate of the fish. Um, and here we see that there was no significant difference between the average um, temperature between clear and algal trials. Um, however, in dissolved oxygen, which is, again, important for this type of trial, because the amount of oxygen in the water um, it influences how much the fish can uptake. So here we see that in clear water, there was a significantly higher amount of dissolved oxygen than in algal um, trials. And this could just be because of a small sample size, um, again, eight and seven, respectively. But um, it's likely that maybe the algae is um, uptaking some of the oxygen, as it's a mixture of spinach, <coughs> spinach and spirulina, an organic combination. So in summary, um, in the natural environment, we're seeing increased levels of turbidity, both of algal and sedimentary type, um, for prolonged periods, really. And what this can do is it can really diminish the swimming performance of shiners, as I've shown so far in algal blooms, and I will hope to show um, in sedimentary and a combination of the two treatments. Um, and what this can really do is it, it can have conservation implications as it can affect the biodiversity and aquatic systems of all levels, um, as emerald shiners have become increasingly difficult to catch in Lake Erie um, this summer especially. So in the future, um, like I said earlier, I'm planning on finishing with 60 total trials. So I'll be in the bunkhouse for a few more weeks. Um, and then I hope to present at the Fall Research Forum at Ohio State, the CFACE Forum in Denman. Um, and then finally, a direction we may go in uh, in the future would be, instead of using the spinach and spirulina combination, we may use microcystis and grow the microcystis, um, which could provide a different treatment as it the toxicity may have different effects on the fish. Um, so that might be a direction that we go in the future. But for now, I don't want to wear rubber gloves um, and deal with toxic water, so we're not doing that. So finally, uh, thank you to everyone that help, has helped me out, the people in my uh, lab at Ohio State, including Andy, and um, all the people here at Ohio Sea Grant Film Lab, and everyone who gives me rides back and forth. Appreciate it.
And yeah, you guys have any questions for me? In terms of the pH, I am not equipped to say that. Um, I do monitor the pH. Um, it's pretty consistent throughout all the trials. I didn't present it here because it was not significant, the difference between the two treatments. Um, my spinach and spirulina combination mimics the particles in the water getting into the gills of a fish. That's, that's why we chose to have the spinach and spirulina. Rather, um, I guess the microcystin might more effectively mimic the difference in, in pH. But um, like I said, that would be for future work, not for this site. Yeah, Dr. B. Do you think uh, given the map loss, do you think you'll try to uh, increase the put, put in additional bubbles or something into the tank? Oh yeah, definitely. So I, I monitor the, the dissolved oxygen every twenty minutes. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I might use an extra bubbler or so to make sure that I'm operating at similar levels of dissolved oxygen, like six or seven parts per minute. There might be a way Oh. Yeah, with uh, nitrogen bubbling. Sorry. With like bubbling nitrogen in the uh, in that you could do that or that but then you wouldn't have the oxygen. There are ways oh. you could bubble CO2 and talk with that, but, but then that could just lower your pH in the water. Okay. So kind of more mimic what's going That's on interesting. Yeah. We'll look into that. Any final questions? Yeah. A uh, rationale for the acclimation tanks, so what was the reason? So that's um rest the acclimation tanks is essentially to mimic like a rainfall event, how you might have sudden increases in turbidity or an increase in algal turbidity. So an overnight exposure to this turbidity is um, essentially mimicking what you would see in the natural environment. So in that acclimation tank, it's not a clear tank. You've already no, no. It with whatever they're exactly. going to anticipate the trial. Exactly. So if they're going to be doing an algal trial, they'll have an algal acclimation overnight. Perfect. All right. Thank Harrison. And All right, so I have the pleasure of introducing Allison Earp, who uh, conducted her REU experiment with, uh, with me this summer. Uh, Allison comes from Youngstown State University. Uh, I think she's got an interesting background in that um, a lot of her family uh, have farms, so a lot of what we are learning this year about the uh, harmful algal blooms, she's going to tell her grandparents, and they're going to disagree with her about what we're learning, but, but that's good. Um, and uh, so she's going to be working, uh, talking to us about some work with some of the buoys that exist in Lake Erie. So on one hand, she had a great luxury of having this plethora of data at her hands. She didn't have to go through the troubles of setting up an experimental tank and not having everything work out right away. Um, but at the same time, she didn't have the great pleasure of being on the lake every moment of time. Uh, but you know, these are trade-offs we have in science, and so I think uh, Allison did a great job in uh, working with this huge data set uh, that these buoys uh, generate, so I was really pleased with what she did, so I'll let Allison take it away. All right, thank you, Dr. Beatty, for that introduction. So for my, um, my um, project, we wanted to see if we could predict algal blooms based on alternate ecosystem theory and specifically these early warning indicators that are associated with an impending algal bloom. Okay, so I'm not going to go into um, the seriousness of harmful algal blooms because I feel like the some of the students before that have already gone into why that's important. So I want to start off with some of the theory behind this work. And so alternate ecosystem theory works on um, the idea that you have two states that um, an ecosystem can exist in. And in the case of Lake Erie, we have um, this 
um, mixed phytoplankton or diverse al algae state in the spring and early summer. And that can consist of a variety of green algae, um, blue-green algae, and also diatoms. And then throughout the summer, as we get more inputs of nutrients from large rainfall events, from you know agriculture runoff of these um, pesticides and fertilizers, we can see that um, cyanobacteria will actually begin to dominate the blooms within Lake Erie. And this is because they are better competitors for light than other um, um, algae species. So <laughs> this graph just shows you what I just explained, but we have nutrients on the X and chlorophyll on the Y. So as nutrients continue to be input into the lake, chlorophyll will continue to increase and we can ex exist in the state here. And as you know, this continues to happen, chlorophyll will continue to increase until we start to be drawn to this alternate state. And then chlorophyll will start to jump up until eventually it just remains in this state and continues along this path. So for my study, we are particularly interested in this area in between where we have this transition between the two states because there is certain things associated with this state that we can use to then predict these algal blooms. So one of those things that are associated with the transition between these two states is the increasing variance. So this, is, this graph is showing basically the same thing. Um, we have chlorophyll plotted through time. We have uh, our mixed phytoplankton state and then our cyanobacterial dominated state. And we can see that as um, nutrients continue to be added over time, that um, you start to go from your baseline state, your mixed phyto, uh, phytoplankton bacteria state, to or algae, I meant to say, to, and then you um, your chlorophyll will get to, will start to actually be drawn to this other state, and it will jump up. And this region right here, where we are seeing this transition between the two states, we see a large variation in the chlorophyll data itself. So. One of the ways that we looked at um, measuring this variance within our project was looking at standard deviation calculated through time. And this graph is showing you if you were to plot the standard deviation of the chlorophyll values that you took through time um, for your baseline state, which is, the, again, the, the mixed phytoplankton state, and then um, the state where you are transitioning to the alternate state, the cyanobacterial state. So in the blue is the standard deviation um, distribution for the baseline state, we can see it exists at a lower value than that of the area of the transition state. So with some statistical metrics that we use, we can actually determine the ratio that we are within either of these distributions. So if you have a data point that is in here, that is about right there, you can have a higher likelihood that you will exist in this transition area. That means that you are more likely to be approaching an alternate state, the cyanobacterial dominated state. Whereas if you have one about right here, you would have a low likelihood that we are approaching this alternate state. And therefore, you are not likely to see an impending algal bloom happening. Um, and the way this um, statistical metric works is that this likelihood can get increasingly large, which then tr trigg triggers an alarm, which tells us that um, an algal bloom will happen in the future, or could happen in the future. So that's basically what we're testing. We wanted to see if we could use the statistical metric um, to predict these algal blooms that have happened in past years. And in the future, if this um, study were to be successful, we would like to see that water stream managers could actually use this to see, receive um, text alerts of these blooms that are happening so that they can better prepare for these things happening. So these are the different buoys that we use within Lake Erie. You can see we have a buoy up by Toledo, our very own buoy off of Gibraltar there, and then also a buoy near Cleveland. We, all we took chlorophyll data from these buoys from roughly the past three years. Data from 2015 was not available for Cleveland. But, and you can see that I have labeled the Cleveland buoy our baseline buoy. And what we did is we used that buoy kind of as uh, a baseline to determine the, the standard deviation distribu distribution, which I talked about a little bit earlier. So basically what we did is we took all of our chlorophyll data through the years, and we uh, took daily averages for the different sites. We got rid of any large gaps in our data because we can't 
perform this time series analysis when we have gaps in our data because we need a data point for every step along the way. And then we got, uh, we dealt with small gaps by averaging the, we took the day before and the day after and we averaged them together. And we also log transformed the chlorophyll data. And then we calculated our standard deviations with a 28 day rolling window. And what that is, is basically, we have a time point and every 28 days before that time point is the data that you would use to calculate the standard deviation. And then you can continue that through time until you have <coughs> standard deviation of your, um, all your chlorophyll data throughout the years through the different sites. And then we did, we plotted the, the distributions, which I showed you earlier. And Cleveland, like I said, was our baseline buoy. And we had a certain mean and a certain standard deviation that were associated with this distribution that we could use within our statistical, statistical metrics to determine when these warnings were occurring. And then we also had a transition distribution, which the mean of that existed outside the maximum value we had at the Cleveland site. So we're kind of setting this up in a way in which it kind of mimics the theoretical model we saw earlier. And then the standard deviation of each of these distributions were roughly the same. So I just wanted to show this to remind people that 2015 and 2017 were very bad algal bloom years and that 2016 was less severe. And these are taken from the NOAA satellite images that we saw um, somebody present about last week. So getting into some results, these are from 2017. We have the Cleveland and the Toledo buoy data. We have the daily chlorophyll average plotted, as well as the 28-day standard deviation. What you'll notice in the Cleveland site is that um, the chlorophyll levels are rather low. They do not get, not really even above two. And this is what we would have expected, and this is what we wanted, so that it would be representative of a state that doesn't really experience these algal blooms, and therefore could serve as our baseline state. And then in the Toledo site, we had much higher chlorophyll concentrations that um, were higher for an extended period of time. And what you'll notice here is that you have a point where the chlorophyll peaks and the standard deviation rises as well with it. And even though we are seeing this rise in standard deviation associated with this um, peak in the chlorophyll data, um, the standard deviation through time for each of these sites isn't much different. It's, all, it's mostly around 0.5. So even though we have two different, we have um, a site in the central basin that doesn't experience prolific aloe blooms, and then we have one near Toledo that does, the variation in the standard deviation isn't very large. So this is showing you the same thing, but now I have just plotted the um, a point at which we received an alarm that um, an algal bloom would have been occurring. We can see that because standard deviation does increase significantly at this point, it does trigger an alarm. However, the alarm is not early like we would have expected. In fact, it does um, coincide with the maximum chlorophyll concentration for that year. So I'll just quickly summarize some other results. I don't have time to show the graphs for, but um, so I, like I said, 2015 and 2017 were really bad bloom years, and unfortunately, we couldn't get our method to work to detect these blooms or give us alarms that these blooms were going to be occurring. In 2016, for Gibraltar, we did receive an alarm, but that was associated with a large diatom bloom that we had in the early summer months there, and then. In Toledo, same thing. We do have an alarm, but it's late in the season, and it corresponds with the max chlorophyll concentration. So we might conclude that this method um, isn't exactly working accurately yet. Um, this could be because early warning sig um, signals do not always exist in these situations, particularly um, because we're dealing with a seasonal shift in Lake Erie between the mixed phytoplankton state and the cyanobacterial dominated state. Um, we might conclude that this is not representative of a true alternate state in a sense, because in alternate states we might expect that an alternate state ex ex exists for an extended period of time, whereas this is a seasonal shift. So going forward, there are lots of other things we could do. Um, for our study here, we only looked at standard deviation, but there are other statistical indicators that you could 
used to detect these early warnings associated with these algal blooms. One is autocorrelation. Then there are a lot of other parameters that these buoys um, measure, uh, specifically pycocyanin, which is a pigment associated with blue-green blue algae, cyanobacteria, and that could give us better results. We could also look at dissolved oxygen as well. We could also refine our current method, test other distributions, um, varying di um, lengths of rolling windows for standard deviation, such as, like we did a 28-day standard um, rolling window lengths for standard deviation, we could do um, 21 like some other studies have done. And then with that, I would like to thank Dr. Darren Beatty, who helped me along the way with this, even though it was something that he wasn't, he didn't have a lot of experience in, uh, in himself. And then Dr. Justin Chaffin for giving us data for the uh, Gibraltar buoy, also Ohio Sea Grant Program, Friends of Stone Laboratory, and a few others that um, have made this project possible. So I will take any questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, well that wasn't something we actually looked at, but I suppose it does make sense in theory. Um, the idea with these alternate states is that there's an increase in standard deviation as you approach the alternate state, but because the standard deviation that we use is actually relative to the mean of our chlorophyll concentration, it doesn't show much variation between like the Cleveland site and the Toledo site. So that would definitely be something we could look at in the future, yeah. Yes? So, for some of the sites, like I think 2017 for the Gibraltar site, um, there was a period of time where they actually had to take the buoy out of the water for, I don't remember exactly why, but there was, so for some sites there was missing data at the beginning of the season, but also there are periods of time in certain sites and years where there's a chunk of data that um, appeared, the buoy appeared to be malfunctioning and the data was all over the place, or it was just stuck at a certain number, and we had to get rid of those as well. So, yeah. Fortunately, that's an issue when you're doing time series analysis. Thank you. Our final speaker is Alyssa Armstrong. She also comes from Youngstown State. Uh, if you notice that we put both Youngstown State students at the end. nutrient limitation of nitrogen fixation of the lictospermum in the central basin of Lake Erie from the years 2015 to 2017. Now I'll explain basically all four parts of my title. So as we've kind of been talking about, uh, harmful algal blooms are kind of a huge problem in Lake Erie um, because of the toxins that they have produced. And here's just a picture of a really bad bloom from past years. Uh, so 
cyanobacteria are basically what make up these HABs. And uh, the reason that they're called cyanobacteria or green algae, uh, green blue algae, are actually um, one of the pigments, uh, biocyan, is actually used in photosynthesis, which gives it its color. Um, and these are the ones that produce all the different toxins, as Krista and a couple others have talked about. Um, so I'm specifically looking at uh, delictospermum, which is a type of cyanobacteria that can produce these toxins. Um, delictospermum was formerly known as anabina, um, but it's now delictospermum. And so these are filamentous, so that means they form in strings, and they form these brown little cells. There you go. So the brown cells, and they form in a string called a colony, and how the nitrogen fix is by forming a heterocyst. So the heterocysts, as pointed in the arrows, are these blue little dots. Um, so you can actually see them, which is pretty cool, because you can then uh, compare. So uh, delictospermum is found in the central basin mainly, um, but it's been observed that the delictospermum in the central basin don't have as much of these heterocysts. Um, in the central basin, the delictosperm will also bloom in kind of early July, and then they die off, and then the microcystin comes in, and then there's kind of like um, a reemergence later in the year. Um, but the biggest one is in the early July. And this is this year, actually. Uh, so this nice big area is a delictosperm bloom from this year. Um, so you can kind of can see where it's right smack dab in the center. Um, so, what's kind of interesting about finding this in the central basin is that the central basin has lower phosphorus values and higher nitrate values when normally delictosperm is found in high phosphorus and low nitrogen because it can then uh, adapt to that low nitrogen. Um, heterocyst formation is actually high energy intensive, so when they aren't limited by nitrogen, um, then they won't form these cells because it takes a lot more energy for them. So that could might be why we find lower amounts. So um, nitrogen fixation process or even the heterocyst formation is dependent on other things besides just nitrogen availability. It's also dependent on phosphorus or on iron. Iron is actually used for an enzyme that is required for the nitrogen fixation process. And boron is used in the cell walls because it's really important to keep those thick cell walls to have all the chemical reactions happening inside them. Um, so um, lower levels of heterocysts in the central basin might also indicate of these lower levels of boron or iron. So the current debate kind of in limnology is what will happen if we reduce the nitrogen load in Lake Erie. So one kind of side of things is that these nitrogen fixers will then add the nitrogen to the water to kind of equalize out a load of nitrogen if it's then lowered. But the other sign could be that it won't affect or it will equal out or um, other reactions could happen in this environment. So it's pretty important to understand what forms these heterocysts and what impacts these heterocysts because then they can then add the nitrogen to the water and then overflow and have a bloom. So <laughs> all these different parameters. Um, so this is as he said, it's a long-term process, um, project. It's been going, this is the third year, it's a four-year project, looking at kind of the nutrient constraints of all planktonic growth, um, but I'm looking at the lipospermum and heterocyst, um, and its ability to, ni to fix nitrogenic, uh, to atmospheric nitrogen. And there's a nice picture of a clump of uh, the lipospermum. So how they did this was basically by a nutrient assay. So they grabbed lake samples and then added the nutrient um, treatments and then let grow. And then afterwards, they test it through a flow cam, which we're going to get to next. So the five treatments I looked at was phosphorus, phosphorus and iron, phosphorus and boron, and ammonia. So they added ammonium because um, it's the source of nitrogen, so it can then impede the heterocyst. And the control was basically plain lake water. Um, so here is the flow cam, which is the scary instrument. Um, it's a pretty ingenious device. It's basically a camera connected to a microscope. And the water is flowed through this tube there and through to the, mic the microscope here and down. 
and it takes about 20 pictures a second, but you kind of can adjust, and it kind of auto-focuses as well. So I was able to identify, count, and measure the Dilictospermum colonies, um, and I could then sort out whether or not they have heteroses. So This is what I got to see. So this is kind of the spreadsheet, and then you get a visual spread of all the pictures that it could take and automatically focus. So it was all mixed up, and my job was to then filter out the Dilictospermum, to identify and filter out. Um, I got to stare at a lot of pictures. <laughs> so this is what I did. I made a classification of heterocysts, of Dilictosperm with heterocysts and Dilictosperm without heterocysts. So these are without. So these, I have pages and pages and pages of all these different kinds of uh, these different Dilictospermum in different sizes and shapes. Um, and here is the heterocyst. You can kind of tell there's little blue dots everywhere on here. Um, so I got kind of excited when I saw shapes. You can kind of can see my favorite shape there was like a heart. <laughs> my famous heart shape that I've showed like a dozen people. But um, so I could compare the heterocyst versus uh, non heterocyst. Um, so here is my first earliest sample we have, which is July 2015. Um, and so I did percent heterocysts. So they also take into account the count, so the number of pictures, and also the particles, which in this case would be like um, the number of cells. So when they take into account the percent heterocysts here on the y-axis, um, it's also count and particles that the uh, computer can do. So here is a different treatment, and the error bars, uh, it's basically um, standard error, and then I did an OMNOVA test and then a Tuki test. So um, the letters kind of show a significant change between everything. So here, um, the phosphorus and boron actually had higher, significantly higher, than the rest of the treatment, which is kind of interesting. Um, and my p-value was nice and low. <laughs> so um, next, I also looked at biomass. So, so total biomass over this treatment, seeing which kind of um, helped grow the Dilectospermum the most. Um, I had lots of variations with my sizes. Some had large, some had big. So the, the large standard error kind of gave me um, lots of great results just because of my p-values being so high. So you kind of can tell that all the phosphorus treatments were really high compared to the control, but they've also got super high variance kind of discouraging, um, but we did also in August 2015, again with the heterocyst. So this one was actually Cospetiferex, which is really similar um, cyanobacteria. Um, that year didn't really have a whole lot of uh, Dilectospermum, so we looked at heterocysts instead. Um, here we had a significant um, grouping of phosphorus, phosphorus and iron, and phosphorus and boron. Um, we we're so close to having boron almost significantly, um, but again, that high um, standard error didn't quite get there. So biomass for that sample also was Cuspidiferix. Um Again, high standard error with basically a general bump in the phosphorus with a low control. So on to 16. So lots of data, lots of years. Um, so here, iron actually had the highest, but it was also still grouped with phosphorus and born was still kind of in between the groups, so it means it was, um, you know, kind of similar to this, but still up here with this. Um, so, again, biomass for the sample. So this one had a little less of a bump. It had a higher control, but um, big standard error there. So next, 2016. Um, this one kind of got funky. I, we had a really high control with really large variants. Um, so on sample, basically. Uh, the bi the biomass of this one didn't seem to um, reflect that result. So this one, again, kind of had that bump with really large standard error. So finally, we only had one for 2017 so far. Um, and this one had the lowest percentage of heterocysts, um, which could be a future trend or just be something of that sample. 
Um, and this one kind of, again, had a high control with high standard error. But the biomass was kind of the most interesting part of this one. So the biomass actually had um, significance between the samples. And um, the phosphorus and ammonia had the highest, which kind of makes sense because of the um, intensive energy process it takes to make heterocysts. So instead of making heterocysts, they go into growing more. But the cool thing about this one is that boron, as we've seen kind of trend in some of the other ones, in heterocyst percent, boron also had highest um, uh, biomass. So that tends to lead to, okay, let's see what we have collectively here. So boron may have an underlining effect on heterocyst formation. So I mean, with boron and phosphorus sometimes had a higher effect than some of the phosphorus, which is kind of a really cool, um, you know, conclusion to this big, long three-year project. Uh, ammonia did pretty much a DAW. Um, it inhibited the heterocyst, which was kind of the, the um, hypothesis. Um, and the biomass for all of them was basically phosphorus limited. And I would like to thank everyone who helped me with this, which is um, Dr. Justin, Dr. Justin Chapin, uh, who is the advisor, all the research assistants for driving and helping then run the LOCAM, uh, Ohio Department of Higher Education, Ohio C Grant for funding everything, for you know buying the pretty cool piece of machinery, and then of course OSU. I did not. I, with the whole, I just wanted to make sure that everything kind of flowed, so I have not. That might be something. That might help you. Mm -hmm. No one else has any last any positions? All right, all right. So let's thank all the speakers again. Clarification on our photos page, the SL needs to be capitalized. The SL needs to be capitalized in photos. And after this, the RUs are going to meet downtown and we're going to meet on the dock and go get ice cream. And